Thanks, Joe. Hmm. Next year, I celebrate celebrate <laughs> uh, 40 years working in the field. Uh, and I'm head of Human Factors International. We do UX design. We also set up practices in UX, and we're the largest training and certification company. Um, I think we're the largest standing company that just does UX. That was the end of the ad. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I started putting up this slide. This is what it looks like when I draw. And what I was saying was, we've gone through and we're going into the third wave of the information age. And what it means is that there was a time you don't remember, when, <laughs> when hardware was a challenge. I remember I was the first UX guy working at Dell, and it was like, how much RAM? How much ROM? I have to get it just right. Now it's like, how much RAM is in your computer? I don't know, enough. It's not a differentiator. Nobody wins in the market because they've got a great laptop. Then you had a phase where getting software to work, it didn't matter if it sucked, if it just didn't crash, that was good. So we went from IBM ruling to Microsoft. And then I said, ah, that's going to become a commodity too. And we're going to have another wave, which is UX. And it's happened. And so now we see stuff coming out of Forrester and stuff like that, where, where it's like companies that are good at user centricity, they do better in the market. Design, it, they do better in the market. We see clients, we're up. Why is that going up? We can see again and again that we're the key now. We're the differentiator. It's our turn. And that brings up something for me that really bugs me. So CEOs all around the world are going, customer experience is strategic imperative. Now, if it's a strategic imperative, do you really do it on the cheap? Do we need to go into like, we're doing budget UX, we're doing lean UX, we're doing starving UX? I would think that if you really believe that UX is the strategic imperative, you would do it on an industrial scale. And I think that's important. I got just two things I want to talk to you about. One is what it means to do UX. And the other is how do we set it up on an industrial scale? Because that's a question that's different. When we do UX, why are we the differentiator? It's not because we paint nice screens. You see Apple... And they're like worth more than Rhode Island. And you see Sony and they're dying and they're selling their headquarters. What's the difference? Sony does pretty designs, Japanese designs and all that. But what happened is Apple made an ecosystem solution where the things fit together. Right? You got iTunes, you got iPod, you got the Genius Bar, it all fits together. Companies that do that, they succeed in the market today. And we're the only ones who can make that happen. The problem we have is we have so many digital channels, and they're all different. And if your answer is every digital channel does everything, you don't understand yet. And we need to figure out how do we take those digital channels and make it so the user experience isn't like, I just want to, where the hell do I go? Right? How do we put all the pieces together where, where there's the website and the tablets and the mobile and the call center? How do we make everything fit together? Interesting problem. That's our challenge. We need to be out looking at things like even how the stores work and how the call centers work. And the idea that you know, maybe I make them match. So my website has tabs and my, my store has signs that match. No, that's too radical. Pervasive information architecture. We have to think at that level. Let me show you what happens when you screw it up. I didn't make this up, I promise. Right? You have internet banking, you're a bank. This is your bank. Ah, internet banking, cool, and cell phone banking. Nice, okay, and then... Mm -hmm. Telephone banking is different than cell phone banking. And then there's another thing called speech banking, and what the hell? And there's .mobi. 
So this is what happens. This is what happens inside of companies when you haven't thought about the big picture. You want to collaborate? We bought all these. No, pick one. It'll be our... Where do I go? So the problem is that you have siloed groups and organizations, and they're all building things in their own technology platform, their own technology stack, their own environment, and they're working hard on their programs, and they create fragmented user experiences. And there's only one group, us, that can pull it together and make a coherent experience out of it. And it's fun and complicated because you have lots of different users, each needing their own coherent experience. That's why we need omnichannel strategy. So if you're thinking about doing UX, the first thing and the highest thing in the value chain is you need to do omnichannel strategies. That needs to include not just how the channels get used and seen, but also the emotional aspect. That's actually the first thing. This is an example of a bank. It's in India. And when we studied users, what we found is they felt they were afraid of losing their money, high value, high net worth users. And they felt if they had stuff customized for them, they'd be safer. It's probably not true. Doesn't matter. Um, so we made the frame investment solutions must be based on your needs, both explained and unexplained. The meme, we understand what drives you, and that ends up going throughout the site and throughout all the channels. And even their TV ads that would be about that. We understand what drives. So we deal with the emotions, and then we figure out how the user thinks about it, how the user can understand where to go. If this takes more than one breath to explain, you're in trouble. Right? But you have to be able to say, this is when you go to a native mobile app. This is where you go to the browser. This is the call center. What is the answer to that? <coughs> it's actually not trivial to figure that out. And whatever your environment is, Having an answer to what those channels are and what drives people to work with you, that's key. Then we have the structural design stuff. You're probably used to that, right? We've been doing that forever. Now I'm going to design a website, I'm going to design a native app, whatever it is, and we've been doing that forever. And you have the problem if you can't find things like this is from Singapore. And they've spent a bunch of money developing low-fat recipes. Where do you go? to find low-fat recipes. <laughs> Any idea? Yeah? Eat workout video. To find the recipes, you have to go to HPBE resources, healthy fun, and then healthy recipes. If the user can't find it, the function's not there. But we've been grappling with this since the mainframe days. This is real. I did this. It was an insurance app. You can't even tell what it is. And they're like, oh, it's a mainframe. It has to be hard to use. It doesn't. We've made it like this. It's the same screen. Right? And so we've been doing that forever. You know, you get, once you get the omnichannel strategy, you get the structural design right, you don't have blizzards of, of windows open, you make containers that people can move around in, and sometimes you can't even see. It's subtle, but you know, this is an example where there's a Boolean kind of search, and we just break it out, and all of a sudden you go, people perform, actually the competitors were doing better. Now we're better than the competitors, and people prefer it, and that's good. And this isn't just websites and apps. It's things like IVR, from 90 seconds to 22 seconds. So the structural design is key. And then we have to deal with the detail design. And this you've got to do based on cognitive psych. If you don't understand how humans decide how they see, how they move, you won't do a good job. And this is all little stuff, but it matters. How many people have seen this study? Almost nobody. OK, which is better, the top or the bottom? Only the eye is different. How many people think the top one's better? OK, bottom one's better? OK, we don't know. Um, so it turns out the bottom one's better. Because the top one, you connect, and most people like it, but you don't look at the product, right? So if you're not looking at the product, how are you going to sell it? So I manipulate the user's visual scan. And if that's a 
you feel bad about that, you can compromise like this. <laughs> so it can be little tiny things. Like, can you find the phone number for Abraham, uh, Abraham Edwards? Is that it? Uh, well, any of these. Yeah, John Edwards. Any of these. It's like I'm going to get lost. But what about if I just do that? Little tiny lines. These little things matter. Hmm? And then you have stuff like this. Uh, please note the following required documentation must be attached at the end of the application without which we are unable to proceed. Like, what the hell? Just say you need. Right? So you take all of this stuff, and it's like, yes, I'm over 18, and yes, I'll include it. Like that. So that's the kind of rethinking we need to do. About nine years ago, I came out with a slogan, which was weird for me. It said, usability is no longer enough. Everyone's like, he's doing drugs again. <laughs> so you have usability. I can do it, but will I do it? That's a significant difference. And so we start looking at the emotional stuff, a whole journey around that. Like, we did some work for the California lottery. And we're like, lottery? People have trouble doing math. It's like, actually, no. What it is, is it's like buying a ticket on a roller coaster. People do it knowing that they're going to lose because it's exciting, because it's fun. And so if you have a, dis you know, you can actually track people in, in their scenario as they get excited and lose and get hope again. And so, you know, like you buy a ticket and you feel hopeful. And then you check the numbers, and you're excited. And then, of course, you lose, and so you're disappointed. Right? We can actually watch people go through this kind of thing in the scenarios. And so you, when you have a design that looks like that, that's not exciting. So we re-engineer it so you know, it's, it's more fun. It's a game, right? And you can engineer other things. Like one of the problems is when you play the lottery, you're going to lose, right? and you feel like a loser. So what we do is we make a screen like this which shows you how much goes to education, and then you don't feel like a loser, you feel like a philanthropist. <laughs> this is for our basic class in, in persuasion. These are, every one of these is a different tool you can use. I dress in all black when I teach this. I'm pretty close now, because these are the dark arts. But, Still, use them for good stuff. And, it's good. and there's so much we can do. Like, you know this kind of thing, right? We see things and judge them based on comparisons. So if I look at that circle and that, they don't look the same size, but they are, right? How do we apply this? Here's a design that's perfect from a UX viewpoint. I can read it. Everything is lined up. But it sucks. Because what we find is that people look at the shipping and estimated taxes and go, damn, that's a lot of money, and leave. <laughs> so how do I make that look smaller? The dark arts. I just go, like, put a big number next to it, and now those look smaller, see? You'll see that in many sites now. Or I can use scarcity. Like, hurry, you, it doesn't matter. So I know all these techniques. It works on me. <gasps> So the thing is, we know how to do this work. There's a methodology from omnichannel strategy, innovation, through all this. All, this is, we understand it. We've been doing it for a really long time. So it turns out that when you do UX, it pays off. I don't know if you've seen Nielsen Norman Group's report. It's really good. And they've studied so many different projects. And there's, what they're saying is, you need to invest about 10% of your development budget, of your headcount, in UX. Note to self. So when I go and I see companies in this, like, so you've got 0.001% doing UX. That's a problem. And the results are huge, right? I mean, you're looking at major improvements in performance. And we see this in our practice all the time. This is a uh, an environment we worked on. We did the reviews. We did omnichannel strategies and structural design standards and all the usual stuff. And people liked the design. Big deal. Net promoter score. Woo. Um, don't really care. They spent more time on the site. 
measure of engagement. 145%, 180%, that's good. Uh, and it went from the worst in the industry to the best, and it, they spent more time than even things like uh, newspaper sites. But what really matters is the number of leads goes skyrocketing. Okay, that I like. And we're migrating more people to online services. So we see the advantage of that, and you probably all got examples like that. What you may not also be pointing out to people is that usability is free. So, yeah, it's 10% of the development spend, but somebody has to do the work. I mean, is it better like, to have non-professional people do that work? It's like, without the tools? Oh, that good. Um, you know the cost of making a change? It goes way up as de development goes ahead. If you find out earlier, it's cheaper. Just doing the early usability testing, that alone can save 10%. It's free. We build so many facilities that no one uses. This one, they have like a third of a million people come to the site, 60 go to this one. It's just the guy's cousins. <laughs> and yet we build it and code it. So just don't do the things. And then one Royal Bank of Canada did a study, just putting a standard in place saved 10% in development. No, I really needed that one app to say back, cancel, and start again. What? One problem we have in the industry is we're forever talking our own language. Speed, accuracy, training, satisfaction, safety. Yay. That's what we talk about. You need to know your organization and what the levers are for that organization. This is a bank. Capture wallets, capture markets, control service costs. That's what we talk to the executives about. They don't understand speed accuracy. Now, we go to the, the World Bank, and we say, how about this? And they're like, save money? No, we actually have all the money already. So for them, it's we can't eradicate poverty using awkward apps. Understand the levels, the levers for your organization. OK, cool. It's kind of interesting. I, I get introduced sometimes as like one of the founders in the field. And I'm like, the field started in World War II, and I'm not that frigging old. <laughs> We've been around a really long time, actually. Most of you are third generation. I'm second generation. I'm standing on Al Chapanis and Sid Smith and a bunch of shoulders. And so we know how to do this work, but we're battling some dark stuff. The darkest is the people who think it's just common sense. There's nothing worse for our industry than people going, oh, yeah, that's obvious. You know what? The problem is it seems like it's common sense. It's like if you have a bridge that's broken and you go to drive over it, it's like it's common sense. It's broken. I can tell I'm wet. If the website sucks, I can tell I'm being tortured with technology. But if you want to know why it's broken, you want to fix it, you need a civil engineer. And if you want to fix a website or an app, you need a UX engineer. It's not obvious. And these kind of guys are killing us. Actually, they're pretty much going away now because people are seeing it doesn't work. But like design hacking, great UX without time, money, or design skills. <laughs> yeah, sure. You believe that? I got a bridge. It looks like the last one. Right? Or discover how to instantly improve your UX. Come on. What kind of crap is that? Right? One dollar UX. I was like, oh, great. Or you'll see com companies that just like go, oh, we're going to make it pretty. Now, we do that too. This is our design. It's, like, it's nice. And, and so nice visual design is good. We even also engage, as some of the earlier presenters were talking about, in gratuitous, pretty graphics. But think about the best sites around today, the most valuable sites. It's like, uh, OK, Facebook, they have blue. And 
And uh, Amazon has light blue. They ran out of blue. They couldn't afford it. <laughs> Fidelity, Tom Tullis is there. Great stuff. Green. Woo. Facebook couldn't afford anything. I mean, sorry, YouTube couldn't afford anything. It's like, maybe it isn't about eye candy. Yeah, there's a role for good visual design, but that's not the main thing. So if that's what we're talking about, we're not really talking about UX. Some people are like, we're going to have really cool tools. No, we have oculometers, eye trackers. It's like, tell me what we learn from looking at an eye tracker. I've been doing eye tracking since 1976. Like, OK, so I can watch right, the scan. And you know, what design insight, do, what, what did I learn? I mean, you spend a lot of money doing this stuff, right? And at the end of the day, you know, I know that the participant is a guy, right? <laughs> Great. Or I love this one. Here's a guy. He has a YouTube video. I'm not making this freaking thing up 12 minutes on how to pretend to be a UX professional during a job interview. <laughs> yeah. And there's the comment, that man is a blessing from God. I didn't need the doctorate. It's great. This is why I did the freaking certification program. I knew that would happen. <sighs> OK. So this is a little bit about what it takes to, to do UX, to design UX. Scale is the real challenge today. Fifteen years ago, I went. This is the recent book, right? Uh, Fifteen years ago, I went, we kind of know how to design stuff. But how would you do it at scale? How would you do it for a large company? That's not the same. So it's not like you just take, OK, I know how to do design. Now I'm going to get 500 of me. And I'll put them in a room. And wonderful things will happen. It doesn't work like that. This tells you everything you need to know about having a UX practice that's for real. Is your UX group a street gang or an organized military operation? The differences between those two this is all based on certain individuals with their personality, and we hope they're cool and strong and found a nice gun somewhere. These guys, it's systematic. It's process-oriented. They're trained. They're certified. They have government backing. There's a whole set of things that make it so when these two fight, who do you want to stand behind? Because, you know, that's where we're going. We're going to be fighting the companies with the best UX win. I want to stand behind the guys that have a system. There's basically nothing good that we found about craftsmanship. Jared Spool and I had a debate called the Celebrity Deathmatch about 10 years ago. He's changed his mind since. But he said, you know, UX will never make it systematic, will never make it process driven. It's like, and I said, I am doing that. Um, and I thought I won. But if you do UX in a serious, organized way, it is faster, cheaper, better, and more creative. Think about shoes, right? Cobblers versus Nike. There's a reason there are no more cobblers. Because it's just better. And if you're a professional, where do you want to be working? In a street gang? Many of you know how much fun it is to be the sole UX practitioner. Like, what do you do? Paint screens. Fast. It's like, good. That's high value. Right? So we need to take our organizations through a metamorphosis to have serious UX practices, which sounds really like 
abstract. But now you don't have to buy my book. Because this is basically what it takes to set up a UX practice. And if you miss any of these things, you're in deep trouble. So the journey that we've been on for 15 years is figuring out what are the pieces that matter in order to set up an effective practice. You need an infrastructure. You need the right org structure. You need staffing. You need executive championships supporting all of that, or it's not happening. OK, finish taking the picture. OK, cool. Um, now, today, getting an executive champion to go, this matters, I want UX, is actually no problem. The first book had a big, thick chapter on getting an executive champion. I took that out of the second one. Because today, 97% of companies, their C-level executives are going, UX is a strategic imperative. They are not quite sure what that stands for. UX. But, but they're saying that, and they're signing up for it, but they don't understand how to do it, which sucks. And they go through a pretty routine set of misconceptions. Like they'll go and they'll put a big sign at the front, we love our users. They put posters out, right? give you little things to put on your desk, we love our users. Like it's a motivational problem. Right? There's somebody at the bank who wants to make customers suffer. No. It's an engineering problem. Right? It reminds me of the first joke I heard when I was a kid. I grew up in New York City. So there's a bus broken down at the middle, bottom of the hill. And the bus driver jumps out and grabs this woman's chihuahua, a little dog, ties it to the front of the bus. The woman says, what are you doing with my dog? And he's like, I have to get the bus up the hill. She says, a, a chihuahua can't pull a bus. And, and the driver said, no problem, I have a whip. It was New York. But <laughs> so beating your staff to be user-centric doesn't actually work. Then they do weird stuff like they're like, this is for a shoe company. And they're like, I know what we're going to do. We're going to get customers in the room in the design sessions. Customers are not designers. How do you pick those people? It's like, you run fast. Come design the software. Or you bring in training, hopefully from us. This is us training in China. But just training people, it's like I got trained and I suck out here and there's no methods and no standards and nobody knows what I'm doing and I don't, I'm not in the process and I'm all alone. That doesn't work. Or you hire some expensive consultants like us. And we can do a good project and then you hire a bunch of different consultants and you build this kind of chaotic thing. Or my favorite is the executive, right? So the, uh, the CEO of Sony, they're dying, right? And he's like, I'm going to be the design lead. And I look at his background. It's like, he's never designed anything. No, but I'm Steve Jobs. I had some Zen meditation when I was in high school. I don't know if it's, right? This is, by the way, the problem. So I'm, I'm really happy... Apple's out there because they show how powerful an integrated solution is. Did they institutionalize it? Yeah, I think it might be based on... And, you know, he's like, step down. And uh, so, at the end of the day, you need to go beyond, I have this Zen master, to I have a practice where we routinely do it so it's integrated and all that. I need executives who support it or you don't have the foundation, right? I need the infrastructure. We spent 15 years building the infrastructure of methods and standards and stuff like that. By the way, if you reinvent that, that's a three, five year journey, which I don't really recommend. Um, you need a tool set. So this is everything about a given user profile in one place instead of having to go to 30 different projects and read all the docs. Object-oriented UX means this. So I can go and find everything related to that given user or whatever. I have one client, it's Telco, and we started working for them, and I said, do you have any data we can use? They said, we have seven terabytes. 
of UX data. But don't get too excited because we can't find anything in it. It's like, okay, great. Uh, and you need the right staffing. This is from a program we did last year. We did the first bot program, Build, Operate, Transfer. We set up a 51-person UX team. From scratch, everything. And so this is what we see as the future industrial-scale UX with methods, with standards, with a sustained operation. Okay. I have a couple more minutes. I can talk about some hot topics. Um, innovation. Have you ever gone out and checked out some of the innovation groups, it's like, you're just a corporate suggestion box. There's actually an alternative. There's user-centric innovation where you start with an understanding of the ecosystem, and then you drive from that to understand the needs. I know that's radical. Right? But you can do that. We did that for this one for Intel. This was from a major ecosystem project, and that started looking like this, and that's the Classmate PC. I think we're up to 12 minute, million units sold. And it's all over the world. So innovation can be user-centric. It's part of our remit. It's fascinating to deal with, with the cross-cultural things. I had a team, a U, an HFI team, and they did an icon. It's like, let me tell you what that means in, in um, the UK. It's like, well, we thought it was B for victory. Um, but everything, any symbol you use, like this symbol, like, okay, yeah. In the US, it's okay, right? And in Germany, it's great. And in Russia, it's zero. And in China, it's three. And in Japan, it means money. And in Brazil, it means a body part. And uh, in Tunisia, it means I'll kill you. So we find things like, this is real. This is uh, built for illiterate users in India. And isn't it cool? They made the hand brown. It's localized, which is OK, except money isn't green in India. So the users are going, green paper? Why do we need green paper? I, right? I oh, forget. I don't have time for this. Um, agile. You know. Agile is not like a UX person's idea. It's a dev method, sorry. And it's not like good news. Hey, we'll do Agile. That'll make the UX great. Yeah. Agile can work as a detailed design alternative. And only for that. If you're building something big. If you're building like a little doggy dish, it might not be so bad. But but if you're building something real, it's a detailed design alternative. You need your omnichannel strategy. You need your innovation. You need the high-level design in place. And if you don't have all that, you'll suck. And, and you need to then have an agile framework for doing UX work. We don't walk in, hi, I'm the screen painter. No, I can use iRise. It takes forever to learn that. <laughs> and we have to deal with questions like, Defining the MVP, the minimum viable product. Have you ever been on an Agile program? They have right, MVPs, minimum viable product. And it's like, actually, that's an MP. It's a minimum product, not viable. And it's our job to figure out whether it's viable or not, if you think about it. But do we? And so there's a whole process we need there. Um, have you seen the new groups that are doing customer journey mapping? Now, that's kind of interesting for me. When did we start doing customer journey mapping? As far as I know, early 70s. Yes, we called it performance analysis. And, but now we have a new customer journey. We changed the name. And we make pretty looking graphics instead of just boxes. Other than that, it's exactly the same. The reason why this is really uh, popular is that Right? I can teach you to do customer journey. You want over dinner? We'll just like, it's 10 minutes. Like, here, do a flow chart of the work. Look where people get stuck. And so it's popular. But it, the problem is, it's a tiny little part of what we do. It only works to improve things that exist. You can't build a substantial system 
with customer journey mapping. And if you try, you will train wreck. And I've seen it happen again and again. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to say. So we're in a great industry. Welcome to that. It's fascinating. You learn new things. But we're at a turning point. We're actually kind of getting past the UX washing. It's seen as strategic. And the question on my mind is, can we move from, ah, I've got a person, they're smart, to we have a serious practice. And I see that as the challenge in the field. Thank you. Does that mean I don't have to repeat it? <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I was briefed like eight times. Remember when they ask a question, repeat it, because they won't have a microphone. And then they sprung for the mic. Can you name any companies that are good examples? Of yeah, there are. Um, so there are, and they're weird. So I've, I've seen companies like um, China Construction Bank. An example of a company that actually is level five certified by us and bought nothing from us. It's all copied. But they have a great practice. Look at Rolta, which is a, a small systems integrator. Their top guy was like, we're going to do this. And we stood up the practice. And it's level five. And, and they're making a boatload of money off of it. So there are a bunch like that. Um, and then there are ones that are doing great UX stuff. The Googles, the Apple, and I go, yeah, you've got some really smart people, but is it institutionalized? And so they're, in a way, our friends, but don't think that that's a sustainable solution, kind of the, the edge of, like, yeah, yeah, we're doing it. The future is companies that can build that as a machine, I think. Okay? Everyone's like, yeah, okay, we know everything. We believe everything. Thank you. All right, who else has a question for Eric? Anybody over here? Anything? No, they're like, yeah, no, we got it. Yeah. That was more than we wanted, actually. Our last chance. All right, well, let's thank Eric once again for being part of our event.